Chapter 6. Ethan. The children, all three of them, had been enjoying the five days that they had been at the camp at the foot of the temple. Ethan's father had taken them up to and around the temple several times, and Leah's father, an expert in biology and zoology, had taken them for a few trips into the forest to look at the wildlife. The flora and fauna had fascinated them as much as the temple, especially since Ethan and Verity were only used to seeing, at best, wild deer back in the UK, and that had been once on a school trip. Leo's father, who was working with the team on the historical connection to zoology, what evidence there was on site about the food that the Maya people might have been eating, had shown them capuchin monkeys and toucans, spider monkeys and basilisks. To Ethan's slight disappointment, these were not the enormous, quite literally petrifying creatures of ancient myth, but rather passive, quite harmless lizards no longer than the children's forearms. What these creatures had in common with those in the legends was beyond him. The children discovered that the forest noises were loud in the mornings, loud in the daytimes, and loud at night, all with different sounds. Insects, birds and mammals all contributed to the soundscape of the Guatemalan forest. One morning, the twins had even resorted to arguing about when a forest became a jungle and what the difference in definitions between the two was. Without Google to defer to, such discussions never had the resolution that they did when everyone's friend and general expert was called upon in a given conversation. They realised that Google had a lot to answer for in society, in life, but Google always had that answer. But still, five days into their Maya experience, they had yet to enter into the temple. It's just that we have to do some investigation first, Ethan's father had said. You no go in. Not now. Not tomorrow. Maybe later, Ernesto kept saying. I'm sorry, kids. Soon, I promise, Edwin had repeated. Ethan's father had been particularly busy poring over a certain artefact that had been found before the children had arrived at the camp. He had shown it to them and it was something that Ethan wouldn't forget in a hurry. Daniel had ushered them into the tent with a reverence that made Ethan feel he was entering a church rather than the mud-encrusted marquee. The twins and Leo had quietly gathered around a trestle table laden with trays full of half-cleaned and part-labelled objects, all forgotten, forsaken in favour of whatever it was that lay beneath the only pristine white piece of cloth that the children had seen in days. Without speaking, Daniel had slowly removed the veil, revealing a green head made from carved jade. Ethan's breath caught in his throat and the silence that filled the tent told him that the others had been similarly affected. It was not the gleaming polished surface of the mask that had stolen his ability to breathe, nor the size of the artefact. The combination of the two would ordinarily have impressed Ethan because of the value they implied. No, firstly it was the eyes. Where the majority of the object was the same shade of green, gleaming in the rays of sunshine that pierced through the gaps in the rough canvas of the tent, the eyes were startlingly white, with bottomless pitch black pupils. As the sides of the marquee shifted, so too did the light, and as it danced across the eyes, they seemed to move too. The shape of the eyebrows gave the eyes a sad, even mournful look that was only made more real by the gaping mouth. The lips were stained red, and in the darkness of the open jaws, Ethan could see a tongue. The face looked like it was about to scream, and for good reason, curved, knife-sharp ivory teeth seemed to burst from beneath the very surface of the jade's skin. Some came from the from within the sides of the mouth, curving around and over the lips, stretching the lips into a silent, open-mouthed cry. More erupted through the cheeks and forehead, as if a brutal creature made from nothing but vicious fangs and violence was trying to rip its way through the stone face. The whole thing was horrifying. After a few moments, Ethan realised that the artefact was not a solid sculpture, but a mask, a thought that was accompanied by an immediate desire to pick up and place the cool stone over his face. He had known feelings like this, the way he felt that he needed to pick things up to experience their realness in his hands. This time, though, he felt different, 
Maybe it was the excitement of simply being at the dig site. Maybe it was the stories of masks that gave their wearer superhuman powers. But Ethan felt a powerful craving, an undeniable longing to hide his face behind that of the screaming stone. It was an urge perhaps powered by childhood dreams, but one that filled him with a sense of dread, one that Ethan would resist at all costs. It would probably have been worn by someone important during a ritual ceremony, perhaps even a human sacrifice, Dad had told him as he picked up the mask and held it gently in both hands. We're not sure what to call it. It's amazing, eh? Where Ethan was all cool and awesome, Verity was silent, letting her eyes do the excited talking. That had been on the second day. The next day, they had seen their father deep in highly energised discussion with several people about something. They had obviously found another artefact or seen something in the temple that had raised their heart rates. Someone had been brought into the camp and they had seen their father talk to him. They had both been excited and animated. Because the other man seemed, from a distance anyway, not to speak English, Edwin was there to translate. The man had been pointing up to the top of the temple, indicating with his head and moving his arms about eagerly as he spoke. Then he pulled them over to an item he was holding, somewhat like a camera. Some of the men, including his dad, crowded round and watched in silence. Something had happened. That much Ethan was sure of. Something important. A few nights later, Ethan's father had spoken to them at some length. He was equally animated as he spoke then, eyes shining with wonder. Ethan remembered it well. One of the archaeologists has found some glyphs, some symbols, carved into the rock inside the temple. I've taken a look at the glyphs over the last day, and it seems... it seems that they tell us something. What, Dad? Ethan asked, intrigued. Well, it seems like they say, or indicate, that the jade head is, or has, some kind of curse cool? No, this is perhaps super cool. Ethan rolled his eyes. His father continued with a verity spellbound. We think that the jade head might well be cursed in such a way that it brought about the decline, the end even, of the Maya people. At least that's what the people who lived here must have thought. The excitement was contagious. Ethan's eyes widened. So this head thing was the reason the Maya civilization ended? It seems that way, or it seems to be that the Maya thought something like this, which makes that head of enormous interest, priceless really, in terms of Maya artefacts. Everyone is buzzing right now. It's, are you telling me that you think this head is cursed enough to have spelled the end of the Maya? Verity interrupted, that this head has magical qualities? Well, not necessarily. I am saying that the people who lived here thought that. As for magical curses, there is no evidence yet, apart from on my laptop. But he trailed off. But Ethan couldn't let it drop. He had a feeling that this was linked to whatever the adults had been watching earlier. Dad seemed to realise what he had said and quickly changed the direction of the conversation. What is certain, <clears throat> he cleared his throat, is that this could be a real part of the history of how the civilization ended. That's amazing, Dad. Man, I can't believe it. Do you reckon it was like the curse of the pharaohs? Maybe it's diseased. Maybe it was left here by aliens with some kind of weird device inside it or some kind of substance that we can't even detect coating it and everyone who comes into contact with it is cursed. Oh, oh no, maybe we shouldn't even touch it ourselves. We could all be doomed. Have you thought of that, Dad? Are we in danger, Dad, are we? Ethan's voice moved quickly to a panicked pitch as he rattled off his theories. Calm down, Mr. Aliens did everything, including giving us ancient batteries. Verity smirked. Shut up, V. No one can explain the Baghdad battery. I reckon it was aliens who showed those guys how to use basic electrical technology. Come on, Ethan. We've been through this. No serious academic believes it was an ancient battery. You need to stop watching crazy TV shows. Don't believe everything you see. I see you, V. Come on, kids, give it a break, their father said, exasperated. Look, all I can say is that if this pans out and we need to do some checks, then this is an amazing find. Together with the glyphs, this is one of the most important Maya discoveries for years. Heck, maybe ever. 
Edwin is beside himself with excitement. This place is electric. I've got to do some tests and research tomorrow, but I have to admit, this could be the highlight of my career. Wow, what a great start to your holiday. I mean, your work, Dad. I was wondering, though, who was that guy you were speaking to the other day? Asked Ethan. Ah, yes, I was going to tell you. I didn't want to worry you. He was a guard here before we got here, before most of the team had visited here. He, uh, he had an experience. An experience? V was intrigued. He noticed some lights from the temple. He went to investigate and he saw, we think he saw, the jade head and weird lights. And then he, well, he, he fell unconscious. Anyway, don't worry about that. You just stay safe and keep having fun. But Dad! That sense of awe and discovery, excitement and dangerous adventure had remained with the children. So they hatched a plan. On the fifth morning, they had been taking their breakfast, as they normally did at their HQ, as they called it. Between them, they would agreed that they must go into the temple. There was no negotiation here. It was going to happen. Their plan involved asking to go to the river about a 20-minute walk away, which they were allowed to do on their own, and go and look for wildlife. They would be down there for a good few hours, or at least this was what their fathers were to believe. This would allow them perhaps three hours in the temple, if they were not seen by anyone. The three children packed some equipment in their rucksacks and met at their camp HQ. Just as they were about to set off, they heard some raised voices from the middle of the main camp. Looking over to the centre, Ethan could see his father embroiled in an argument with Ernesto. The bulky man took off his hat, waved it around and then jammed it back on his head. The conversation was in Spanish. So Ethan couldn't make out what it was about, but it was clearly pretty important and a little heated. There was a lot of hand and arm waving, raised voices and pointing at one of the tables in the central tent. What's going on? I don't know, Ethan, said Verity. But since our dads know that we're going to the river, I guess now's a good time to get out of here. I didn't like Ernesto anyway. I like him even less now. He gives me the creeps, Ethan complained. The trio turned, leaving the twins' father to fight his battle, and walked out of the clearing and away from the pyramid.